and granted a stipend of a hundred dollars. This enabled Hegel to press on with his great philosophic work, The Phenomenology of Mind. But Hegel's phenomenal activities were not limited exclusively to the mind, for around this time his landlady became pregnant. This fact crops up in Hegel's biographies like the occasional rare gem of lucidity in his prose. One flash, and it's gone, smothered in a welter of obfuscation. But this was no philosophical system where the truth can sometimes remain obscure until long after its author's demise. The landlady named Hegel as the culprit. Napoleon was now gradually extending his domain over Europe. Conflict with Prussia became inevitable, and in 1806 French troops marched into Jena. Hegel despised Prussian bureaucracy and welcomed Napoleon, but this was not really a remnant of his youthful revolutionary fervour. Rather, he felt he was witnessing the process of history at work in accordance with his system. I saw Napoleon, that world soul, riding through the city. Next day, French soldiers began looting and setting fire to the houses in his street, and Hegel fled to the house of a nearby professor with a manuscript of The Phenomenology of Mind in his coat pocket. Judging from the size of this work, he must have been wearing a very large coat. Here Hegel completed the final sentences of his masterwork while the French and German armies battled outside the city. According to one story, when Hegel heard the soldiers returning, he interrupted his work to peer out the window and ask, Who won? The French had won the Battle of Jena, and Hegel was overjoyed. The world soul was continuing its advance through the soulless world. But after the battle, the university was forced to close down, and Hegel found himself practically broke again, reduced to living off his stipend. The following year, The Phenomenology of Mind was published. This book is generally considered to be Hegel's most masterful and complex work. Kant had already set 800 pages as the required length for a German philosophical text, and here Hegel showed he was up to the standard of his great predecessor. But where Hegel far outshone Kant was in the prolixity of his prose style. As an example, I have purposely chosen one of his clearer, simpler sentences. Meanwhile, as mind itself is not an abstractly simple entity, but a system of processes wherein it distinguishes itself into moments, but in the very act of distinguishing remains free and detached, and as mind articulates its body as a whole into a variety of functions and designates one particular part of the body for only one function, so too one can represent to oneself the fluent state of its internal existence, its existence within itself, as something that is articulated into parts, and so on. This matterhorn of a molehill may appear hilarious taken one sentence at a time, but after several hundred pages you may find the joke wearing thin. Yet do not be deceived into thinking that the entire work is like this. Hegel gradually, very gradually, built up to a final apotheosis in which absolute knowledge was described. It's difficult even to conceive of a sentence of over half a dozen lines that remains throughout its entire length utterly bereft of meaning. Just try. But by now Hegel had the bit between his teeth, and could manage it for pages on end. To know the pure notions of knowledge in the form in which they are modes or shapes of consciousness, this constitutes the aspect of their reality according to which their essential element, the notion, appearing there in its simple, mediating activity as thinking, breaks up and separates the moments of this mediation, and exhibits them to itself in accordance with their eminent opposition. Hegel claimed this was an attempt to teach philosophy to speak German. Some think he succeeded but this mischievous view is an insult to German, the language of Hölderlin and Rilke. Before trying to teach philosophy anything, perhaps Hegel should have taught himself to speak German. But what exactly does all this mean? One cannot produce an 800-page work in any language without it meaning something. Armed with this article of faith, many a scholar has ventured into the quagmire of Hegel's prose. Some have emerged as Marxists, others as existentialists, and still others have not emerged at all, the Hegelians. In the end it took Hegel ten volumes to summarize his philosophy. The new definitive edition of his works by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft is expected to run to more than fifty volumes. So any attempt to encapsulate Hegel's thought is like trying to infer, from the tiny bone at the tip of the dinosaur's tail, the huge, lumbering, extinct beast from which it originated. 
In The Phenomenology of Mind, Hegel describes the logical process by which the human mind rose from simple consciousness through the stages of self-consciousness, reason, spirit, and religion to absolute knowledge. This contains the blueprint upon which he was to base his great all-embracing system. Hegel's system included absolutely everything. Whether it is right about absolutely everything, or indeed anything at all, depends upon how one regards its basic structure and dynamic. The entire system rests on Hegel's original mode of reasoning, his celebrated dialectical method. This starts with a thesis. For example, existence. According to Hegel, this is inevitably seen to be inadequate and incomplete. When we contemplate the notion existence, it generates its opposite, its antithesis, non-existence. This too is then seen to be inadequate, and the two opposites then merge to form a synthesis, in this case, becoming. This synthesis retains what is rational in both the thesis and the antithesis, and in its turn may become another thesis. This allows the process to be repeated in a series of triads, ascending into ever more rational realms. As it becomes more rational, it becomes more spiritual, and as it becomes more spiritual, it becomes more conscious of itself and its own significance. This process arrives at absolute knowledge, which is spirit knowing itself as spirit. But the vital element of the system remains the dialectic, which operates at all levels, from the loftiest spiritual realms to the murkier processes of history, art, science, and so forth. An example of Hegel's dialectic at these levels is thesis, architecture, antithesis, the romantic arts, synthesis, classical sculpture. Whether or not the above argument bears any relation to the truth as we see it is not our concern for the moment. It is presented merely to illustrate Hegel's method and the sort of material he put through this universal mincer. A more vague, abstract example, to which of course the method was much more suited, is thesis, universality, antithesis, particularity, synthesis, individuality. Hegel's dialectical method, which he referred to as logic, sprung from a laudable ambition. He wished to overcome the main deficiency of traditional logic, the fact that it was entirely vacuous. Logic never says anything about anything but itself. Take, for example, a traditional argument such as, all philosophers are intellectual megalomaniacs. Hegel is a philosopher, therefore Hegel is an intellectual megalomaniac. Logically, this argument would be just the same if it were about wizards, magicians, and Merlin, so it could be written, all A are B, X is A, therefore X is B. The logical form remains the same regardless of the content. According to Hegel, the aim of logic is truth, but if the truth is empty of content, what is it? Nothing. The empty truth of this traditional kind of logic gives no information. It cannot discover the actual truth. Hegel wished to overcome this separation of form and content. His argument runs as follows, and he intended that it should be absorbed in its entirety. Leaps of ordinary logic, which may defy our credulity, are resolved when the argument is viewed as a whole, we are assured. Hegel begins by saying that logic is the study of thought. As we have seen, the dialectical process ascends toward mind, or absolute spirit. Mind is the ultimate reality, abstracted from the particular forms it assumes in the natural world. It is mind that shapes the world, therefore a study of how mind works, thought, will reveal how the world works. From the above argument it follows that there is no objective reality independent of thought. Indeed, in The Phenomenology of Mind, Hegel argues that thought is objective reality, and vice versa. The two are one and the same thing. This means that when logic is directed toward thought, it is also directed toward reality. The subject matter of logic is thus the truth as it is. So the dialectic, with its triadic method of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, has both form and content. It works the way the mind works, and it deals with the truth as it is. A thesis generates its antithesis through its formal inability to accommodate its content in its entirety. As in the thesis existence, which necessarily generates its antithesis non-existence, with the two then merging to form their synthesis becoming. 
Undeniably, this system generates a wide range of striking, profound, and thought-provoking ideas, but these remain essentially poetic. Indeed, the whole system is essentially a beautiful, poetic idea, but this butterfly is pinned with a sledgehammer, and in many of the lower reaches of the pyramid the ideas are not a